As I mentioned, today we'd like to welcome you to our third series, um, our third session in our series, the online learning series on humanitarian law and policy. Today's session is entitled The Fundamental Principles of IHL, Regulating Hostilities, and we'll be discussing military necessity, distinction, and proportionality. I'm very pleased to welcome Dick Jackson with us today. Dick is the Special Assistant to the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General for Law of War Matters. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to have him presenting on this topic, and he brings an incredibly valuable practitioner's perspective to these issues. Now, before passing the reins over to Dick, I'd like to review quickly the learning objectives to the session. And as those of you who are regulars to the series know, we begin each session with learning objectives in an effort to ensure that uh, we are accountable to you, our audience, our participants, in addressing um, you know, what we've promised. So in today's session, we'd like to first talk about um, what the aim of IHL is. And we'd like to discuss how, how um, it endeavors to limit the effects of hostilities for those who do not participate or are no longer participating in hostilities. We'd also like to discuss this balancing that you see inherent in almost all of the principles we'll discuss. This balance is between the humanitarian imperative on one hand and military necessity on the other hand. We'll also be discussing the definition of what is a military objective, and of course, this is fundamental to the rules of conduct of hostilities. We will be discussing also, of course, the principles of distinction and proportionality which undergird this framework. And we'll also be addressing precautionary measures and the prohibition of superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. Unnecessary suffering. Now, taken together, all of these form the framework um, of rules and regulations that regulate the conduct of hostilities. Now, there are a number of, of very technical, um, very important issues that Dick will introduce to us and that we will, of course, end up having to pick up in later sessions. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dick and begin the session. Greetings from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's great to see people from as far away as Nepal and Australia on this, uh, this presentation today. First, I'd like to begin by thanking Anharad and Beth for the invitation to speak today. PHAP's a great organization, and I've been a member for several years. I really appreciate PHAP's interest, uh, which I attribute to some of the founding members of PHAP, Claude Brudeline and Naz uh, Maserati, uh, to, to get uh, practitioners of IHL and the beneficiaries of IHL, those that apply the law and those that help provide humanitarian assistance, together to understand the, the basic uh, principles that undergird uh, the application of international humanitarian law, or uh, as we call it, uh, the law of war. This is a, an outline of the topics I'd, I'd like to cover briefly today. There are two branches of IHL, Geneva Law and Hague Law. Geneva Law protects the victims of armed conflict, while Hague Law pertains to the regulation of hostilities. There's too much material to go into a deep dive into all of these topics, at least during the first half hour. But I encourage you to ask questions, and we can get deeper into some of these topics if you're interested in the last half of the online course. It's important to note that international humanitarian law, which as I said is also known as the law of armed conflict or the law of war, applies to all parties to the conflict as a matter of customary international law. But IHL is generally a creature of treaty law defined by states and binding states in their conduct. Though the principles are founded in of, of regulation of hostilities are founded in the Hague 1907 treaty, thus the name Hague Law, the rules um, uh, are, that we find today are principally located in Additional Protocol 1 of 1977. Much of what we talk about today also is customary international law, even for those states like my own that have not ratified Additional Protocol 1. These uh, rules for regulation of hostilities are demonstrated by state practice, if not by opinio juris of states. <clears throat> 
these are the basic principles of, of IHL. And as, as Beth said, IHL balances military necessity and humanitarian, humanitarian concerns through its principles and rules. That's to say that both these interests are balanced with, by, and within the principles and rules themselves. Military necessity provides for all measures not forbidden by IHL, which are indispensable for securing the complete submission of the enemy as soon as possible. This definition is accepted by most states and is derived from the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Those trials also condemn the concepts of Craig's raison put forward by some German defendants after World War II. Military necessity does not trump the rules of IHL. In fact, military necessity is already built into the rules, as we shall see. Distinction is the principle that requires the fighter to distinguish between military objectives and civilian objects, and between combatants and protected civilians. This principle also prohibits indiscriminate attacks. Collateral damage is a bit of a euphemism. It's a shorthand for civilian casualties, injuries, and destruction to, to civilian objects. Finally, proportionality is a great example of the balancing of military necessity and humanitarian interests. And we'll cover each one of these uh, uh, principles in greater detail. Subparagraph A of uh, Article 51.4 of Additional Protocol 1 uh, uh, forbids the indiscriminate use of a weapon, whereas subparagraphs B and C prohibit indiscriminate weapons themselves. Customary international law unquestionably includes similar prohibitions. Under subparagraph A, an attacker must, must aim at a military objective. In other words, he or she may not fire, regardless of where the weapon will strike, into an area containing both military objectives and civilians or civilian objects. A classic case is the Iraqi Scud missile attacks directed at densely pop populated areas in Israel and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia during the 1991 Gulf War. Although the area contained military objectives, the Iraqis made no effort to target the latter as such. This violation is theoretically distinct from directing attack, uh, directly attacking civilians or civilian objects, which is also prohibited. In the International Court of Justice nuclear weapons case, several states invoked the prohibition on indiscriminate attacks in their assessment of whether any attack with nuclear weapons would violate LOAC. There is no equivalent rule in additional Protocol 2 for non-international armed conflicts. Similarly, attacks by bombardment by any means or methods which treat as a single military objective a number of clearly separated and distinct military objectives located in a city, town, village, or other area containing a similar concentration of civilians is prohibited by Additional Protocol 1, Article 51.5. Let's go on to uh, proportionality. The main problem with the principle of proportionality is not whether or not it exists, but what it means and how it is to be applied. It's relatively simple to state that there must be an acceptable relation between the legitimate destructive effect and undesirable collateral effects. But it's essentially a, an objective and subjective test at the same time. For example, bombing a refugee camp is obviously prohibited if, if it prohibited if its only military significance is that people in the camp are knitting socks for soldiers. Conversely, an airstrike on an ammunition dump should not be prohibited merely because a farmer is plowing a field in the area. Unfortunately, most applications of the principle of proportionality are not quite so clear cut. It's much easier to formulate the principle of of proportionality in general terms than it is to apply it to a particular set of circumstances because the comparison is often between unlike quantities and values. One cannot easily assess the value of innocent human lives as opposed to capturing a particular military objective. And note, this is a combination of the, this objective and subjective test, expected casualties versus military advantage. Now, I've underlined uh, expected and anticipated to 
to emphasize that the the test is done before an attack and it has to be judged based on what the commander knew at the relevant time and then the other portions are emphasized in order to emphasize this balance but the balancing test is not one of equality but whether or not the the injury to civilians the death of civilians and damage to civilian objects is excessive in relation to concrete and direct military advantage gained the third principle that we'll talk about just briefly is the principle of unnecessary suffering or humanity uh, this principle is directed at combatants it it prohibits those things absolutely prohibited by treaty and uh, the intent behind use of items which uh, would could would be and are intended to cause unnecessary suffering the Hague Regulations of 1899 and 1907 uh, prohibited weapons which were of a nature to cause superfluous injury. The Declaration of St. Petersburg of 19, 1868 said that the only legitimate ob object which states should endeavor to accomplish during war is to weaken the military forces of the enemy. That for this purpose, it's sufficient to disable the greatest possible number of men that this object would be exceeded by the employment of arms which uselessly aggravate the sufferings of disabled men or render their death inevitable and that the employment of such arms would therefore be contrary to the laws of humanity so you see this military necessity and humanity balance in the unnecessary suffering principle itself for example the certain conventional weapons treaty prohibits specifically the use of glass or plastic plastic fragments undetectable by x-ray and the St. Petersburg Declaration itself prohibited bullets designed to explode within the human body. Most in states apply a design intent standard. If the bullet is designed to explode after penetrating the outer skin of a vehicle, however, it's not prohibited. I review weapons and ammunition for the Army you can see, and you can see the balancing um, in this rule Two, uh, what's the military requirement to disable the, the maximum number of, of the enemy? But what's the, what's the humanitarian concern? We ensure that the um, object is not exceeded by the employment of arms which uselessly aggravate the sufferings of disabled men or render their death inevitable. So something like glass or plastic that will make it very difficult to tr treat a wound is uh, is prohibited under this provision the d targeting rules in the regulation of hostilities are uh, quite often discussed target targets for military personnel include military objectives which we'll talk in greater detail in a minute combatant members of armed forces and those that are directly participating in hostilities this is the definition of military objective from Additional Protocol 1, Article 52.2. We'll examine each of these types of objects with some examples. The nature is, is something that deals with a, an inherently military uh, object, like a tank. Location could be a crossroads or a ridge line, which would be a military objective. For example, we say we seize the high ground because it has military significance purpose is it intended to be used to further the military action like uniforms or equipment or its use has it been converted to military use a school or civilian house are generally civilian objects but they could become a military objective if they're converted into a, a place of refuge or defense by uh, the combatants on the other side let's look at some other examples these are all pretty clear cases, uh, military bases, ports and airfield, command and control facilities. But how about prov uh, facilities that provide administrative or logistical support for military operations? If it makes a, a uh, definite, uh, provides a definite military advantage or it makes an effective contribution to military action, then it's a sorry um, then it's uh, defined as a military objective 
some other objects which may constitute military objectives. Rule 10, for example, of the International Committee of the Red Cross's customary international law study um, says that civilian objects are protected against attack unless and for such time as they become military objectives. When a civilian object is used in a, such a way that it loses its civilian character and qualifies as a military objective, it's liable to attack. The International Criminal Court Statute says that it's a war crime to intentionally direct attacks against civilian objects, provided they are not military objectives. In this context, loss of protection of civilian objects is often referred to in terms of objects being used for military purposes or used for military action. In case of doubt whether an object is normally dedicated to civilian purposes, it's being uh, it is being used to make an effective contribution to military action, it shall be presumed not to be so used. That's from Article 52.3 of AP1. What's the degree of certainty required that, uh, that it's not normally available in armed conflict? Well, that's, uh, that's the difficulty of, of application of the rules. But it encourages defenders to ignore obligations uh, to not ignore obligation to separate civilians and civilian objects uh, from military ob uh, objects. So it's important for, for the defenders to consider this uh, requirement as well as the attacker. Before we talk about precautions, however, let's talk a little bit about special protections for certain civilian objects. It goes, and we'll cover each one of these in, in detail. But medical uh, units and hospitals, both of civilian and military character, are protected. Now this rule goes back to the protection of hospitals and places where the sick and wounded are protected in the Hague Regulations of 1899 and 1907. It's set forth in uh, the Geneva Conventions 1 and 4. Its scope was expanded in Additional Protocol 1 to cover civilian medical units in all circumstances. The extension is widely supported in state practice while distinguishing between military and civilian medical units. Under the ICC statute, intentionally directing attacks against hospitals in places where the sick and wounded are collected, provided they are not military object objects, and against medical units using the distinctive emblems of the Geneva Conventions, constitutes a war crime in international armed conflict. In non-international armed conflict, it's implicit in Common Article 3, wounded and sh sick shall be collected and cared for, medical units shall be respected and protected at all times, and must not be the made the object of attack, according to Article 11 of Additional Protocol 2. There's no requirement for medical units to be marked to be so protected. Once recognized as such, they uh, have the protection of the Geneva Conventions. The law is not violated if military operations are not intended to cause starvation, but have that incidental effect. For example, by cutting off enemy supply routes, which are also used for transportation of food, or if civilians, through fear of military operations, abandon agricultural land and are not prepared to risk bringing food supplies into areas where fighting is going on. For the duties of the occupying power to ensure the supply of food to the population, uh, it's important to consider those requirements of the Geneva Conventions, uh, much of which have been covered in previous classes. For the special rules uh, relating to sieges, um, th th we could talk about those in, uh, at a different time. The customary law rule that permitted measures being taken to dry up springs and to divert rivers and aqueducts must now be considered as applying only to water sources used exclusively by military personnel or for military purposes. In ratifying Protocol 1, the United Kingdom made a statement that the, this paragraph um, has no application to attacks that are carried out for a specific purpose other than denying sustenance to the civilian population or the adverse party. So if the attacks are, are directed at the use by the military, they're permissible. Cultural property is an area of uh, special interest to me. I, I participate in uh, the Committee of the Blue Shield endeavors in, uh, in the United States and elsewhere around the world. But 
the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, uh, originally completed in 1954, but not ratified by the U.S., for example, until 2009, gives uh, special protection to avoid damage to buildings dedicated to religion, art, science, education, or charitable purposes and historic monuments unless they are military objectives. Property of special great importance to the cultural heritage of every people must not be the object of attack unless imperatively required by military necessity. There are many examples of this in, in the current uh, conflicts in Iraq and Syria, for example. Dangerous forces also have uh, particular uh, attention and, and care must be taken if works and installations containing dangerous forces, namely dams, dikes, and nuclear electrical generating systems, and other uh, installations located at or near their vicinity are attacked. In order to avoid the release of dangerous forces and consequent severe losses among the civilian population, for example, floodwater caused by breaching a dam or radioactivity caused by bombing a nuclear reactor. The effects are indiscriminate in nature. The word severe is not defined, and according to the ICRC commentary, it is to be interpreted as a matter of common sense and in good faith on the basis of objective elements, such as the proximity of inhabited areas and the lie of the land. Let's talk briefly about civilians. Civilians are negatively defined. They're individuals who are not members of the military, according to Article 50 of Additional Protocol 1. But they're not members of uh, armed groups, for example. In Article uh, 51, uh, subparagraph 1, in case of doubt whether a person is a civilian, that person should be presumed to uh, be a civilian. But most states do not agree with the ICRC's interpretive guidance that only allow the targeting of members of armed groups who are performing a continuous combat function. See Ken Watkins' article in the uh, NYU Law Journal on that point. But let's cover uh, direct participation hostilities in a little greater detail. The civilian, as I said earlier, civilian population as such um, should not be the object of attack. But they're, and they're protected from um, attack unless and for such time as they directly participate in hostilities. Well, what does that term mean? The ICRC uh, develop, developed and, uh, and addressed this issue in interpretive guidance that was issued in 2009. But that's not the law. It's, it's a uh, volume authored by the ICRC that is des designed to help the practitioner analyze this issue. Uh, and, and what the, what the interpretive guidance provide and, and state practice indicates is that in order to determine whether an individual is directly or actively participating in hostilities, you look at uh, several factors like the threshold of harm, the nexus to hostilities, causation, uh, temporal or geographic proximity, and the role or function being provided. And uh, state practice, we could, we could uh, talk about this uh, later, but uh, the the illustrations give on the on that slide give you some indication of the complexity of this issue. Is a uh, someone sitting at a computer launching a computer network attack a uh, directly participating in hostilities? An interesting question and one which uh, practitioners will be wrestling with in the near future, um, if not uh, immediate or now. Precautions in the attack are an important area to cover too. It's it note the uh, that the wording is contextual. Everything feasible, all feasible precautions may be expected, becomes apparent, and unless circumstances do not permit, the technology available to an attacker de determines whether an act is feasible, reasonably expected, or apparent as well as when choice is possible. In other words, belligerents bear different legal burdens of care determined by the precision assets they possess, a fact the ICRC highlighted in its official commentary on Article 50. This begs the question of whether states must acquire precision systems, both uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets, and weapon systems that permit them to engage in precision attacks. They do not. 
although there may be a moral obligation to purchase precision technology within a state's financial means, whether it does so is a matter of national policy, even where affordable technology would save many civilians and avoid extensive damage to civilian objects. The sole limitation on a state's acquisition discretion is that it may not field weaponly, weaponry that's inherently uh, indiscriminate. It's important to note that precautions uh, against the effects of attacks are equally important for protecting civilians from attacks. There's an obligation on the part of the defender also not to use civilians and civilian objects as shields to protect fighters and military objectives. There's a controversial area in the application of the law. How does a state fighting an enemy well ensconced in a densely populated area affect precautions in the attack? Maybe we can talk about that uh, a little bit later during the question and answer session. But consider some, some uh, recent combat in densely populated areas and whether or not the, the measures taken by states in order to prevent civilian casualties were sufficient and, and whether or not this provision of the law of armed conflict shifts some of the burden to the defender to separate their military objectives from populated areas. Finally, the, the last topic we'll talk about is means and weapons, uh, means and methods of warfare. Uh, this is an area also near and dear to my heart because, as I said uh, earlier, I do the the weapons reviews for uh, the U.S. Army. Means and methods is really synonymous with weapons and tactics. Uh, weapons, many weapons are prohibited per se. For example, poison barbs or the glass or plastic fragments I mentioned earlier. And weapons are prohibited when they're used indiscriminately. For example, certain conventional weapons uh, treaty prohibits incendiaries to be used in concentrations of civilians or landmines used in a manner which makes them indiscriminate. Uh, landmines also have been addressed in what many have termed a arms control treaty, the Ottawa uh, Convention on, on Anti-Personnel Landmines that bans them all together. A similar approach was taken to cluster munitions in the Oslo Treaty. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about a method or tactic that's prohibited under the law of armed conflict, and that's the tactic of perfidy, or treacherous, treacherous killing or wounding of someone on the other side. Now that includes the use of protected symbols as well as the, the use of military uh, uniforms of the other side as well as uh, presenting yourself as a civilian in attacking a military object. The reason for the perfidy rule is to prevent the uh, combatants from indiscriminately attacking civilians in fear that those civilians are launching attacks from the civilian populace. So it's, it's an important rule to maintain in international armed conflict so that the civilians are, remain uh, under the protection of, of IHL. Well, that is a rapid tour de force of the regulating of hostility rules in the, um, in the conduct of, of hostilities. Uh, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear your questions and uh, try and try and drill a little deeper into some of those issues uh, as uh, as Beth uh, marshals up the questions that you've uh, presented to us great those who are interested please note that the assessment code is 8112 that's the assessment code to take the evaluation following the